a couple of housekeeping items. If you haven't muted yourself, uh, please do so for, um, while we're listening to Eric speak. And then if you have questions, we can address at the end of the presentation. I'm pleased to introduce Eric Stein. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science degree in Ceramic Engineering from the Missouri University of Science and Technology. He has been with Viacon for 10 years, three years as a process engineer in various departments, and seven years as a research and development engineer. Eric in his presentation, Electromagnetic Shielding Effectiveness of Glazing Components, which he first gave at GP 2017 and again at Facade Tectonics last month. I will turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Sarah. And I will attempt to do this again. Awesome. Uh, yeah, this technology is uh, great. Um, anyway, uh, thank you. Uh, so I'll get into it. Uh, so Wi-Fi, uh, smartphones, uh, really anything that connects wirelessly. Uh, we all use them. They make sharing data and communication easier. Uh, but with increasing wireless usage, usage comes increased importance to protect all this data. Uh, seemingly every week there's another news story about another major business that was hacked because the security was lacking. Uh, despite these security breaches, however, uh, business organizations still encourage the use of wireless data uh, because of the efficiency it provides. There we go. So the first line of defense uh, in protecting any network from electronic eavesdropping is to secure the wireless network itself uh, through passwords, encryption, or through a firewall. However, this still allows the network to be seen outside of the building or even from a different building completely. And I'm pretty sure we've all encountered it where you check into a hotel, you pull out your laptop to connect to the Wi-Fi, and there's at least 15 options that pop up. And if a hacker can see that a network exists, there's always the chance that they're able to connect to it. Uh, on the other hand, however, if the network isn't visible outside the building, the potential hacker uh, can't connect to it at all. So the second line of defense is to contain the wireless network uh, such that no signal is allowed to escape or enter within the building. So there's two ways to contain wireless signal. Uh, the first is to build a metal enclosure. Uh, this creates a Faraday cage blocking signals from entering and exiting the building. However, as you can see, doing this would uh, really disrupt the views, and I really don't think we want to build metal cages around our beautiful buildings. Uh, so this brings us to the second way to, connect, to contain wireless signal, uh, which is utilizing RF shielding glass. Uh, so on the right-hand side is the electromagnetic range. Uh, this includes radio waves at the lower frequency, all the way up to the X and gamma rays at the higher frequency. Uh, the benefits of traditional coatings operate within the IR, visible, and ultraviolet range, which provide the solar and optical performance. Uh, RF shielding glass uh, provides benefits in both the solar and optical range but also within the lower frequencies where Wi-Fi and cell phones operate, uh, really from the kilohertz to gigahertz range. So typical RF shielding glass can consist of several different configurations. Uh, there are three common laminated makeups and one common insulated laminated makeup. Uh, the laminates uh, on the left-hand side can include one of three makeups. A double low E laminate with the number two and number three coating layers inside the laminate. Uh, an RF film laminate, which includes an RF blocking film layer that is placed up against the surface of the PVB. Uh, or a conductive coated laminate, which includes a transparent conductive oxide coating uh, either on the interior of the laminate, within the laminate, or ideally on both surfaces. A typical insulated laminate unit uh, makeup uh, takes the base laminate, uh, typically the conductive coated laminate, uh, conductive coated laminate makeup due to its high optical transparency, 
uh, and includes a low E coating on the number two surface for aesthetics, thermal, and solar performance. So the graph on the left shows the exterior reflective color for each of the typical RF makeups. Uh, the table on the right shows the various advantages and disadvantages of each makeup. Uh, looking at the variety of color options, uh, with the double OE laminate, the RF film laminate, and the conductive coated laminate, it's kind of a take what you can get as there are limited options for each. Uh, with the RF insulated laminated unit, there's a lot more aesthetical uh, options as you can combine the number two surface, uh, number two uh, surface controls most of the color. Uh, and especially when you combine it with the conductive coated laminate, uh, or C on the graph, as it's very neutral when you compare them to OE laminate or the RF film laminate, or A and B. Um, so, uh, the uh, edge deletion on the table it is uh, required for both the RF film laminate and the double OE laminate, uh, really due to the potential moisture ingression within the PVB inner layer, uh, which leaves the perimeter exposed and gives a path for RF signals to pass around it. Um, each of the laminates, or each of the makeups rather, except for the conductive coated laminate, uh, provide varying levels of acceptable uh, thermal and solar performance. So based on these data points, the focus for the testing uh, was on the conductive coated laminates and the RF unit makeups. So how do we know that the glass is actually blocking frequency? Uh, well, first off, a material's ability to block RF is referred to as attenuation. Attenuation is measured in decibels. A higher attenuation correlates to a weaker signal, which means that more of the signal was actually blocked. A weaker signal means it's less likely for uh, eavesdroppers to gain access to wireless data. And since a decibel is a logarithmic unit of measure, uh, every single decibel increase in attenuation can have a big impact. So the electronic, uh, the electromagnetic shielding test consists of two metal enclosed rooms, uh, as you can see in the pictures, connected by an interior wall with an opening in the middle of this wall called the aperture. Uh, in one room, on the uh, left-hand side of the picture, uh, there's a transmitting antenna, and in the other room, there's a receiving antenna. Uh, the transmitting antenna emits a known signal strength, and the receiving antenna collects any signal that it sees. A signal loss is calculated from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna with the aperture open. And then it's repeated with the opening covered with a metal plate. Uh, this is called the closed aperture. The attenuation difference between the highest possible closed aperture and the lowest possible open aperture is called the dynamic range. The dynamic range is the theoretical maximum attenuation that is possible. Uh, the product being evaluated, a glass in this instance, is then placed in the aperture and the same uh, signal loss is calculated, which results in the attenuation of that specific product. So there's two different test methods to calculate shielding effectiveness, uh, the IEEE 299 and the ASTM F3057. Uh, the IEEE standard has been around for a few decades and is kind of a catch-all method for any material. Uh, as a result, it's been modified for glass testing purposes, uh, really picking out certain portions of the procedure uh, but leaving out others. Uh, because of this, uh, the new ASTM test procedure uh, was developed. Uh, the, this test uh, focuses on the glass itself by making the frame system uh, one of the control variables. Uh, the ASTM method 
uh, also increases the sample and aperture size, uh, really trying to force the signal through the glass and not through the frame. Uh, back to the IEEE modifications and moving down on the table. Uh, depending on the test enclosure or the specific equipment at the particular facility, uh, the antenna types and distances were often changed within the IEEE method, whereas in the ASTM method, they are called out. Uh, frequency range, moving down, uh, was another portion of the IEEE method that was often changed depending on the specific focus of the individual company or the individual building requirement. Uh, so for the ASTM method, the frequency range is called out and is actually extended uh, to include uh, uh, the lower wavelengths. Uh, overall, though, uh, by standardizing the test method for glass, uh, product comparisons can now be made industry-wide, really giving customers more confidence that the product selected will perform as it did in laboratory testing. So there are six different samples tested. Uh, all together within the IEEE method, uh, four laminates and two laminated units. Uh, the three samples on the left were specifically tested within the IEEE method, where the three samples on the right were tested both under the IEEE method and the ASTM method. Uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, the, low e, the low E laminate uh, on the left hand, the furthest left hand side, uh, consists of the two coating layers, both within the laminate. The RF film laminate, uh, which has an RF film within the PVB inner layer, and we'll, we went ahead and included a clear, clear control laminate, uh, tested as a control, uh, which has no coating or shielding performance additions. Uh, of the samples that were tested under the both of the methods, so this would be the three samples on the right-hand side, uh, this includes a conductive coated laminate uh, with two layers of a fluorine dope tin oxide coating, or FTO. Uh, one FTO coating layer was located on the number two surface, and the other was located on the number four interior surface. Uh, having the interior surface conductive uh, aids in creating the metal enclosed Faraday cage I was talking about earlier within the building. So taking the FTO uh, coated laminate and keeping it on the interior, a laminated unit is then constructed with the addition of a low E coating on the number two surface. Uh, for our testing, two different co -E, low E coatings were tested in combination with the FTO coating layers uh, both double silver coatings to, con uh, to really test the consistency in attenuation results. So this is how the attenuation results are shown. Uh, during the test, uh, the amount of signal that was blocked was calculated as the transmitting antenna produced a signal at each individual frequency. So as the frequency increased, results in the graph, uh, as the frequency is increased, it results in the graph uh, for attenuation. Uh, you'll note that the frequency on the x-axis is graphed in the logarithmic scale to better show the results at the lower frequencies. So you can see the dynamic range in black uh, up top and the attenuation for the clear, clear control laminate uh, near the bottom. Uh, for the most part, the attenuation is under 10 decibels uh, for the clear, clear control laminate, uh, which means it's letting a very strong signal through the glass. So next we'll include the rest of the samples. Uh, as expected, each of the samples have a higher attenuation than the clear, clear control laminate, so they are blocking more of the signal. Uh, focusing on the FTO laminate in purple and the RF film laminate in red, you know, both of these samples have a similar attenuation to one another. Um, however, the FTO laminate uh, in purple uh, does perform better than the film laminate up to about 800 megahertz. 
And then the film laminate catches up and performs similarly through 18 gigahertz. Uh, focusing on the Lowy laminate in green and the FTO units in the different shades of blue, uh, the FTO units again outperform the Lowy laminate until about one gigahertz. And then the Lowy laminate catches up and performs similarly throughout the rest of the test. So as mentioned earlier, in trying to determine the consistency between each Lowy coating within the RF units, uh, each of them performs similarly to one another, uh, really showing that the type of Lowy coating that is added uh, doesn't make much difference as long as it is present within the unit. Uh, overall, though, the FTO units have the highest attenuation out of any of the samples. So moving on to the ASTM uh, method results. Uh, again, only three of the samples were tested, really focusing on the FTO conductive coated laminate, uh, conductive coating. Uh, so the laminate, FTO laminate, and the two FTO units. Um, keeping in mind with the ASTM method uh, that the unit size is three times larger for the ASTM method. And the full range of frequencies was tested from 100 uh, kilohertz or 0.1 megahertz uh, all the way up to 20 gigahertz. Uh, as stated earlier, though, the same basic test, test method uh, as the IEEE test is used. However, this time the focus is very glass specific, uh, where every aspect of the method applies, unlike the modifications to the IEEE test. So once again, we have the dynamic range up top, uh, the same colors for the RF film, uh, RF units, and the purple for the FTO laminate. Uh, looking at the lower frequency range, below about one megahertz, you know, neither the FTO units nor the FTO laminate block much signal at all. Uh, between one and 100 megahertz, the electric field, you know, this is where the samples start to block some of the signal. Uh, as expected, the FTO laminate lags behind a bit when compared to the unit of uh, the FTO units. Um, you know, looking back to the uh, IEEE test, it's very similar in that aspect. Um, starting at about 100 megahertz, however, is the plane wave field, and this is where most of uh, today's electronic devices operate. This is also where you can start to see the effect of the low E coating on the number two surface as the FTO units have a higher attenuation than the FTO laminate within this range. Uh, overall, though, uh, the attenuation of each of the FTO units is approximately equal and very similar to what we saw in the IEEE test. So, summarizing the results. Uh, this shows the average attenuation for each sample when split up into three main categories. The magnetic field from 0.1 to 20 megahertz, uh, the electric field from 1 to 100 megahertz, and the plane wave field from 100 to 20 gigahertz. Uh, this really shows the big influence that the addition of the number two coding has on attenuation. Uh, you know, ranging from 130% increase at the lower frequencies you know, only about 1% as it holds pretty close to the RF units in the electric field. But where most electronic devices operate today, the addition of the low E coating gives a, about a 30% boost in attenuation, which keeping in mind the logarithmic nature of attenuation, uh, this boost is pretty significant. So in conclusion, uh, insulated laminated units that utilize a conductive coating within the intralayer, uh, within the, sorry, utilize a conductive coating within the uh, interior laminate, provide the best aesthetical variety, have excellent thermal and solar performance, and also provide the best attenuation compared to other RF makeup options in the market today. Uh, the new ASTM test is the best test for RF shielding glass as it focuses on the glass itself and allows for comparisons to be made between manufacturers. And utilizing an FTO uh, conductive coating in combination with a low E coating provides the best attenuation as the conductive interior
surface better create uh, uh, enclosed Faraday cage uh, due to no edge deletion requirement. And lastly, the type of low E coating does not included does not make a difference as long as it's included within the unit, as this combination will result in the highest attenuation. And with that, uh, I'll take. Putting this on. Uh, yes, uh, this is Raymond Roy with Guardian. Uh, I just want to, can you expand a little bit on the FTO uh, coating itself? Uh, maybe you explained it at the very beginning, and I just, I came in a few minutes late, but um, can you talk a little more about that? It's a, uh, like, in the application or the... Just to, specific... Well, in the makeup, the emissivity, the, you know, when F FTO coating, is it, uh, is it, something that's built on the glass already it's coated or what, what it, fto that's well it's a it's a spray on uh coating uh it's uh actually the the data stop coating by pilkington uh, okay. that we include uh with in combination our number two uh, uh coating layer uh, within the unit um That's about, uh, off the top of my head, I do not know the emissivity, and I forget your other question. Okay, uh, so it's basically, uh, so it is put on a when? When is this applied? Uh, it's, applied to the, it's applied to the glass uh, before uh, lamination. Okay. And can this, um, uh, can this coating, can it be on, like say, I think you had it on surface number four, the interior surface. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then, if uh, is it durable enough to where if you brought that in, that you could coat on top of that? Great question. I do not know. Um, I'm sure you could. I don't know about the looks, uh, the appearance of it, uh, but I'm sure you you, you possibly could. Uh, we've not tried that out here. Okay. But durability-wise, um, it's durability-wise. That's a, that's a great question for durability. I was actually the one to to test the, a lot of the durability. It performs uh, uh, very well. Uh, passes all of our internal weathering tests. Uh, we've also uh, uh, subjected it to um, various cleaning substances, Windex, for example, uh, and it performs very well. It's, it's definitely a very durable coating. Okay. And how about the haze level? Is it uh, similar to a pyrolytic? You know, if I had a sample, it's uh, uh, in in front of you. I would I would give you a sample, and I give you the clear clear, and I would give you the uh, uh, FTO laminate, and you can barely tell the difference between the two. In fact, I've gotten confused myself with the such the high optical transparency um, between the two of which is which, and you really have to feel the coating or come in and verify that it's actually uh, there um, uh, electronically um, just okay. by testing the... Uh, okay, so all that all the data and uh, specifications would be under uh, Pilkington Data Stop then? Is that basically I what you we have them on the, the Viacom website as well. Okay, um, but yes, uh, the, okay. the data would definitely be for, they'd be the same for the Pilkington data stop, yes. Okay, so whenever you say an FTO, you're referring to data stop. Yes. Thank you very much. Great, great presentation. Oh, thank you. Are there any other questions? Um, yes, this is Yuwadi from Guardian Glass. Raymond and I actually work together, so we have questions. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, er yeah. Eric, um, um, great presentation, by the way. Thank you so much. Um, could you touch a little bit about um, what is the specification performance, you know, in terms of level of attenuation for you know for project out there in the market? Like what you know, you, you touch about. Um, 48, you know, dB and 49 and so on, you, you have that performance show, but is mm -hmm. that good enough or is this, 
more than you know the project would require. Um, yeah. Well, each I, each building is different. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say that. Um, I can tell you that the with all, with the FTO laminate uh, or with the FTO insulated laminated unit, uh, we have a built a box uh, that you can um, basically place your cell phone in, close the box up. You can try to call your phone and it won't work. Uh, you don't get any signal. Um, wow. But uh, to your question, is that overdoing it? And I would answer that in, I would say no, it would not be overdoing it, uh, just basically because of where we've been and where we're going in regards to the various uh, frequency ranges of electronic devices. You know, let's say 15, 20 years ago with the um, cordless phones, for example, they would operate at, I believe, uh, 800 megahertz. You know, it would definitely be under one gigahertz. Um, however, today, you know, Wi-Fi signals operate at 2.6 gigahertz, 5.2 gig uh, gigahertz. Um, I believe cell phones are also within that range. Um, so it continues to increase. Um, so the the for future proofing of your of a building. Uh, I would say the higher the attenuation, the better. Um, however, you know, I, I don't know of any off the top of my head. Uh, I, I know someone who would, but, uh, you know, out of various building um, requirements, mm -hmm. uh, they all vary. Okay. So I wish, I wish I had an answer for you. All right. Well, thank you. That's good information. Thank you. Can you talk have, a little bit oh. about the get? Sorry. No, go ahead. Can you can you uh, talk a little bit about the gasket requirements? Uh, great question. Using. Uh, they needs to be a uh, conductive gasket. Uh, so uh, really, it would need to be uh, connected to the building frame in some way. So there are a little bit of uh, uh, pre-planning that is involved. Uh, with that, um, you know, you can either use a conductive gasket uh, or a conductive sil uh, a silicone uh, when you're glazing the the units in place. Um, we've done a little bit of that testing. It's not really our uh, area, I suppose, but I can just tell you that it uh, you just it needs to be uh, let's say conductively grounded. To the framing, uh, the frame, the building frame. So, so, are there any requirements yet as far as ASTM test methods for the conductive gaskets? Uh, not that I know of. Uh, we've looked into this a little bit, uh, actually a little bit with our our sister company, uh, 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 Walsall, and or Walsall Window. And nothing really came out of that, um, so we really haven't done the testing. So as far as I know, nothing has been tested so far. Do, do you know what type of resistance you would need, or is that? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, Again, off the top of my head, I could probably find it for you. If you, I could get that for you. Okay, uh, I'll shoot yeah, you an but, email. I have your yeah, shoot contract. me an email, and I we've looked into this before. We've had that question come up a, a few times. Um, I can tell you what we've used in the past, or what we used for the testing, uh, and I would suggest that as sort of a minimum. But uh, I do know we have that info. That's a that's a great question though. Thank you. No problem. And there was another one, I believe. Maybe. Any final questions?
Okay, then. Well, we will wrap this up for today, but thank you, Eric, very much for taking the time to give the presentation and for everyone. No um, problem. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you next month, third Thursday in May, for our next Thursday Thursday webinar. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.